So that's wonderful. My so I'm the 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 floor is yours, Jeff, and we're very delighted to have you back. It's been a while, I think, since yeah. you've been with the Sangha. Yeah. So yeah. welcome. Uh, at least a couple of years. So um, <clears throat> we're going to have a, my understanding, a half hour meditation practice. Uh, begin maybe with a little conversation now. Any questions or uh, anything about my background, I'd be happy to answer. And then I've gone pretty deeply into the book that uh, we're all studying. <clears throat> Um, my first introduction to this book, and it's on the nature of mind, which is, I think, maybe my favorite topic. So <clears throat> looking forward to that, and then we'll have some, uh, after the talk, we'll have some question and answer, and we wrap up at nine o'clock. That's right. So <clears throat> any <clears throat> I'm assuming everyone knows how to meditate and you're meditators of some sort. How do you settle yourself just now? How do you arrive in this particular moment in the ongoing series of moments in your life? Here we are together, uh, reflecting on Dharma, taking time to practice together, particularly at a time when that, that influence, the influence of our touching the stillness that is always in the background in regard to warfare happening in the world, uh, political strife, all the things that are conflict, that uh, this is the missing ingredient, you could say. This actually softens the context of everything else that's going on in our world. <clears throat> it's very powerful. And we can have confidence that we're doing good in the world when we settle ourselves and find our way to some level of uh, stillness. So generally, I have people doing whatever practice you're used to, um, but beginning very simply with some extended out breath, just is very calming, and we can do it together. Like, let's do uh, three of these, breathe in through the nose, and then long extended out breath through pursed lips, like you're breathing out through a straw. It's uh, very soothing. And then there's a natural pause at the end of the exhale. And we just pause there. We just hang for a moment. Then you breathe again. So let's try that. Breathing in through the nose. Resting in the end of the out breath and then breathing in. Notice the, the shoulders and neck and tension in the body releasing as you have that long exhale. Nothing to do but let the breath go. One more time.
And then if we're used to this, just to soften the gaze so that we're shifting from looking at something in particular, looking even at the screen, to simply seeing. Seeing is receiving the visual field. Passively, effortlessly seeing. And seeing the space you're in. Notice how effortless it is with seeing, also effortless with hearing my voice. And then I'll strike the little tink sing da and we'll begin three times.
just for this moment of complete release. Nothing to do, no one to be. Releasing all your life, all your responsibilities into just now, just this moment, perfectly adequate and complete. Nothing missing. Continue in that way.
come back slowly at your own pace. How is that for everyone? Anyone have a question? Anyone have a comment about our, our sitting together? I guess the best way is if you raise your hand, that would be. Easy. No particular impression, same as always. Like every time I sit quietly, <laughs> perfectly fine. I you know Chandra suggested to me to, um, yeah, just invite your comments. And if there are, if it's, Silence, that's maybe the best comment it could be. Okay, Claudia, unmute yourself. Yeah, um, I kept on struggling with uh, thoughts, you know, that would prevent me from being in the here and now. So I would like resort to the strategies that Chandra and Eve have taught us about like concentrating on counting on the inhale, uh, one to 21 or labeling or, um, you know, like that to try to quiet the mind, try, try to silence it. But I mean, I, I, I'm going to speak for myself. I can't speak for anybody else. I mean, we, I, I'm a somewhat of an intermediate level meditator, I'd say. And uh, I, it's very helpful for me to still get reminded once in a while while we're doing our meditation to, uh, you know, if we have thoughts to come back and concentrate on the breathing and, and you know, do it either dismembering or the labeling or the whatever. Uh, I try not to get carried away with the thoughts because I'm mindful of that. And then I try to come back to the to the breathing, but it's not always that easy. Sometimes I, I drop really easily. And some other times my mind is agitated and, uh, you know, I have to resort to these strategies. So I just, uh, that was one of those <laughs> nights tonight where I, I felt that way and I had to really make an effort to like bring myself back and say here and now, here and now, or labeling or counting or whatever. So, very, very familiar experience, I'm sure, for everyone here on the screen. Everyone. But it's reassuring is to recognize every thought you've ever had has disappeared. Every thought you've ever had is return to silence. Maybe, you know, soon, maybe, maybe it persists for a long time, but you can know it doesn't stay. Nothing keeps it fixed. It's unstable. It can be helpful to, you know, turn attention from the thinking, and you mentioned the breath, that's a good one. Uh, feel the body. That's grounding. Feel the body, the sensation of your feet on the floor, the sensation of your seat, which uh, the body is totally awake within itself. There's awareness through every inch of your body. So if you turn attention in that direction, you'll be surprised, I think, to notice the sensation, the warmth, the tension, whatever it might be but you're turning away from the stream of thought towards something which is a direct experience, sensation of the body. Same with the breath, 
you know, counting, counting the breath. But so there are many ways to turn our attention away from following that, that rattling monkey that goes on and on. Yeah, it's our friend, it's our friend. There's another attitude, if, if we resist, if we push it away, we resent it, we're feeling struggling with it, good time to feel the body. So I'm gonna stop meditating and just feel my body. Well, interestingly, where your attention goes, your uh, awareness, your whole being goes there. So, um, yeah, you can turn, you can turn away. Yeah, turn towards something, direct experience, direct sensation in the moment. Thank you, Claudia. That was good. Yeah, good one. Anyone else? Ted Robbins, I really am enjoying your um, photo there and the look on your face. And I have no idea how you're feeling tonight, but when the photo is taken, <laughs> you're, um, you're in a really good place. There you are. There you are. Welcome, Ted. Yeah, the lighting's not quite as good right now. Yeah, it's okay. I can tell it's the same person as the picture. How did it go for you? Okay. Um, I have some anxiety, which kept welling up, and um, it becomes. Uh, yeah, it's a practice not to push it away. Exactly, not to push it away. That's that's the struggle, the wrestling match. And you can choose not to do that. Just be with it as a sensation. Anxiety has all of these sensations that come along with it. Tight, tight throat, tight tummy, all of that. At least in my own case. Well, okay. Um, how would you like to look at the on the path to enlightenment material today? Everyone's on board for that. That's kind of what's next. Let me get organized here. Okay. There's everybody. All right. This was quite a wonderful chapter <clears throat> in the book. I, it, it was um, amusing to me amongst all the pages. What are there? 330 pages. Only about 12 pages were covering nature of mind is a very, you could say, simple, slim subject. But tonight we're going to really work, I think, with um, not so much in the realm of thinking and understanding, but actually direct experiencing. So let me just begin.
Hmm. Okay. Huh. All right, I'll find it again. There it is. Okay. So <clears throat> this chapter is titled Understanding the Nature of Mind. Which is endlessly arising nature of mind, endlessly arising, as this very moment of experience. So let's examine the experience itself with an open curiosity, I would say, a certain innocence. Our usual understanding of the teachings can become fixed particularly if we've been exposed to many different schools or we've done a lot of study on our own. We build up a fixed view and it's being fixed and rigid. It's very much like drawing a line in stone. But what if drawing a line in sand or drawing a line in water or drawing a line in space. So let's be willing to release our fixed views and come more directly tonight to trust our direct experience, the experience of just this moment, fresh, and uncontrived, just as it is, and actually releasing our personal point of view. So I may have great confidence in some of the practices we've learned or a particular teacher we feel devotion to, and that's our journey. And tonight as we come together, all of us are fresh to this moment. Not sure what's next, what's coming along. No telling what this guy Jeff will bring out. <clears throat> so the idea of releasing our personal point of view. On page 171 in the text, it says, just as a drawing on water disappears the moment it is made, your thoughts are liberated the moment they arise. Note that, Claudia. To experience mind this way is to encounter the very source of Buddhahood. And what's being pointed to is that open awareness, which we are. And we're going to look into it a little more deeply. Within the experience of our meditation practice, there is a key distinction that we'll be exploring tonight in considerable detail. Uh, the core essence of that distinction, that difference, is the fundamental difference between attention and awareness itself. Attention and awareness. What is it that remains constant in our experience of the unceasing change of the mind and body and the world? <clears throat> it is this vivid clarity 
vivid clarity, which is arising as the present moment. Awareness itself. This is the ongoing immediacy of all experience. This is how it's unfolding, how it has come forward towards us, you might say, our whole lives. Vivid clarity arising as the present moment. Awareness through the senses and all perception is itself innocent, effortless, unceasing. So no agenda. Our knowing nature has no agenda. No bias. Whatever comes, it's like, yes. Whatever comes, welcome. And we can know this because our ongoing experience, whether it's a horror show coming at us or great beauty, we're present to it. We're present to it. And that presence is what we're calling awareness itself. So even so, it's very simple. Awareness itself, noticing it, it's so close, you can't see it. Awareness is so close, you can't see it. And it's so subtle, your mind can't understand it. You can't wrap your head around it. It's ongoing, it doesn't come and go. But your mind, your thinking, can't understand it. So that's not a pathway to make connection. And then again, awareness is so simple, so direct, you can't believe it. It's kind of like nothing to hang your hat on. But let's go to something we can experience. Regarding the realm of direct present moment experience, okay? That's where we are, whether we notice it or not. The realm of direct moment experience, present moment experience. Consider this, check this out. What is the flavor of your tongue? What is the flavor of your tongue? What are you tasting? Unless you've got, you know, a lollipop or some chocolate. The flavor of your tongue itself. This, which knows taste, is completely flavorless and fresh. Yet we experience many nuances of flavor effortlessly. There's no, there's no effort, there's no push. There's nowhere to push to begin to taste flavor. It's effortless. So notice that. This is in your experience. Do you know, you put a French fry in your mouth and suddenly a salt, salt. You didn't have to look for it, it just lands. There. Ring the bell. This, which experiences flavor, is also effortlessly aware of sound. No struggle. Recognize the difference. There's a very key difference between listening attentively 
bring your attention towards the sound, listening attentively. And the difference with hearing passively, hearing, which is effortless. And when the bell sound came, you don't have to reach for it. It lands. It just lands in your awareness of sound. And there's seeing, which is the effortless receiving of form and color. We don't often experience it that way as an effortless receiving of form and color. But that as opposed to looking, looking directs our attention and creates an observer. That duality. Don't notice that. Reflect on that. We're talking about direct experience that we can have right now. And the underlying reality here, the basic principle, is very simple. This is actually how uh, Adya Shanti put it, if, you, if any of you know him. He said, this, this, this awareness, this knowing, which tastes is completely without flavor. Like the taste of your tongue. And this, which hears, is silence itself. So any sound that comes is accurately heard. There's no overriding sound in our hearing. It's still, it's silence itself. Anything landing is heard with accuracy and effortlessly. And this, which sees, has never been touched by form or color. And this which feels is beyond all sensation. The feeling capacity of our whole body, anywhere you notice in your body, your legs, your arms, your back, there's sensation there. It's an awareness through every square inch of your body. But in itself, it's beyond sensation. It's not a tickle. It's not a warmth. It's not anything. It is a capacity to feel sensation. And this, which smells, is the transparent and odorless root of all fragrance, all fragrance that we distinguish. So those are our five physical senses right there, the world of perception. And then this, which knows the movement of thoughts and emotions, has never conceptualized, doesn't sound like my mind, has never conceptualized, remains clear, and motionless amidst the endless chorus of ideas. So this is pointing to that still background, the silence, that thoughts arise from that and return to that. Every thought we've ever had has returned to that stillness, to that silence, disappeared. This is our direct physical experience. There's no arguing with it. It's, that's just the way it is. That's how we're wired. Our thinking gets in the way of our direct intuitive understanding. So I'm pointing to an intuitive understanding here. 
very simple, very direct. Again, from the book on page uh, 174, it says, if you allow your thoughts and feelings to arise and dissolve by themselves, they will pass through your mind in the same way that a bird flies through the sky without leaving any trace. But the key word is allow. If you allow your thoughts and feelings to arise and dissolve, also key, by themselves. We're not pushing them around. We're not messing with it. We're not adjusting it. We're not being selective. We just allow them. Allow them to arise and dissolve. In that way, then they have no charge on them. They'll pass through your mind in the same way that a bird flies through the sky without leaving any trace. So now in a little more detail, let's explore together a core distinction at the heart of all these teachings, core distinction. And that would be the distinction between attention and awareness. Attention and awareness. Both are arising in our experience, in this very moment, continuously and inescapably. They're right here. So this is nothing we have to reach for, nothing we have to cultivate. Uh, there's no trick, you could say, to recognizing it because it's right in front of us. But again, it's like I was saying before, it's so close you can't see it. And so subtle, your mind can't understand it. And it's so simple, you can't believe it. So both are arising in this very moment of our experience, continuously, inescapably, they are right here, attention and awareness. <clears throat> And here's how they're distinct from each other. Attention is focused and fixated on objects of perception, looking at something, hearing something, bringing attention to it, touching it. Focus and fixated on objects of perception. Awareness is pervasive open lucidity, like an empty mirror. It's inherently spacious. Do you know how a mirror will reflect whatever's in front of it, but it can only reflect, actually, this very instant, the present moment. It's very accurately reflecting what is before, it, with complete lucidity complete lucidity and a special quality of a mirror, a physical mirror, special quality is nothing sticks to a mirror. Nothing sticks to a mirror. It's always fresh, ready to, you know, reflect the very next thing. Open lucidity, inherently spacious. So attention is a thinking function. We bring our attention where we intend to, thinking, and it establishes an observer, an actor. We're using our attention. It's a thinking function. But awareness is impersonal, no observer. In fact, we say it is an intelligence prior to thought. 
That's a good phrase. The intelligence prior to thought, which is your knowing nature. Intelligence. Attention is effortful so as to sustain focus and concentration. We like bring our attention again and again back to the breath, back to the work I'm doing, back to this person in front of me. Effortful, very effortful, very intentional, lots of purpose. Awareness, on the other hand, is effortless. It's just self-existing. It doesn't come and go. It's always there, this knowing capacity. It's effortless, unwavering. It's spontaneously present and always already here. Attention is colored by emotions. It's vigilant, it's grasping, and it has a survival focus. This is our reptilian brain. This is fight or flight. You could say one of our primary avenues of attention is being vigilant regarding our environment, regarding the, the news, whatever, that whole sense of um, survival. If we're not paying attention, the assumption is we're not gonna survive. Or in fact, our ancestors way back in uh, Cro-Magnon Cro time, those who didn't pay attention to the environment, keep their attention focused on what might be a threat, they didn't survive. So we don't have their genetic makeup. We have the genetic makeup of those who were attentive and vigilant and on the lookout for any, you could say, threat. On the other hand, the awareness, which we are, is an impersonal, clear mirror without any preference. It's open to whatever arises moment to moment. So it never goes blank. You know, the mirror doesn't suddenly become clouded over. It's, it's awake. It's awake to the moment. It's completely awake in just this moment. Attention, on the other hand, <clears throat> is unstable scattered and sporadic. We see that how our, our thoughts, our attention to the breath or to the thoughts, trying to remember the practices that keep us more grounded. We're working with an unstable, scattered, sporadic capacity for attention. But awareness is simply Presence, presence, it's effortless, continuous, and stable. And attention is time-bound. There's a very strong sense of past and present and future. Very locked into time, whereas awareness we could say it's timeless. It's before all constructs of time. Sometimes it's referred to as the unborn. No, no beginning, no ending. And it's eternally present as nowness, what we call nowness, the experience of nowness is the presence of awareness. Attention is anchored to the six senses. 
we're continually distracted by sense perception, which is ongoing. All the things that come in grab your attention, a sound, a feeling, a vision, a smell. And attention is anchored to those sensory experiences, to the perception. Awareness, on the other hand, is the space in which all sense perception arises. We can't know perception if we don't have awareness. It's not a matter of attention, it's awareness, which is the space in which all the sense perception arises, the perception itself. It's our capacity to have an experience of hearing, seeing, feeling, thinking, the space. Attention is cultivated as a meditative state of calm or insight, right? This is the mindfulness practice, all the different ways that we calm and find ourselves uh, calm abiding. That's attention. But awareness, since it's already there, it's simply recognized. It's recognized as innately self-existing. It's spontaneously present. And it is not a meditative state. It's simply recognized. And we could say, and this is a little tricky part, our attention, our thinking, doesn't do a very good job of recognizing awareness. But what actually occurs is awareness knows itself. Awareness recognizes itself. self-recognition. So all these distinctions are indeed, you know, subtle, uh, yet very precise. And they're common to all beings. We're all wired this, this way and have been all our lives. But at this point, they've been named simply everyday mind, everyday mind. And actually, there's a koan amongst the collection I teach. That's an example of skillful pointing out instruction. And it's called everyday mind is the true way. Okay, this is way back in China. 800 years ago. When he was a young man, Chao Chao asked Zen Master Nan Chuan, what is the true way? So Chao Chao was young. He had just arrived at the monastery to train with this great Zen Master, Nan Chuan. And he wanted to have good instruction. He wanted to know, how do I how do I proceed here? What is the best way? So he said to Nan Chuan, he asked, what is the true way? Nan Chuan said, everyday mind is the true way. Very simple, very direct, which we've been describing everyday mind, right? We've been describing it in all these distinctions, attention and awareness, Everyday mind is the true way. And Chao Chao asked, should I then try to keep it or not? To grasp that everyday mind. And Nan Chuan replied, if you try to keep it, you've already made a mistake. And we can feel that in our own practice, do you know? Sometime Maybe we're settling down a bit. We're feeling like 
we're, we're drifting into a good space. And so we kind of grab it, hang on to it, try to keep it. And then it dissolves, it's gone. <laughs> we've colored it, we've prioritized it. So he says, if you try to keep it, you've already made a mistake. And Chow Cho, he was confused and he questioned, but if I don't try, how can I ever understand the true way? And Nanchuan then said, the true way of everyday mind, right, is not dependent on understanding or not understanding. Understanding is illusion and not understanding is blankness. He says, if you completely attain the true way, of not thinking. Attain would mean experience, completely experience the true way of not thinking. It is like space, clear and void. So why do you make right and wrong way? Pointing to great simplicity there. And then upon hearing this, Chao Zhou was suddenly awakened. That was enough. Chao Zhou is very talented. But you see the journey of it. It's really this great master Nanchuan, he pointed to something very direct, very simple, something that actually uh, Chao Zhou already was experiencing. So no point in trying to keep it or understand it. Only the path of attain it, attain the true way of not thinking. It's beyond thought. Okay. So there's this sort of poem that I'll end with. This is from my tradition as well. It's, it's called The Human Root, and it's really describes something very essential to all of us. Again, very personal. Coming empty-handed, going empty-handed, that is human. When you're born, where do you come from? When you die, where do you go? Life is like a floating cloud which appears, and death is like a floating cloud which disappears. We're that insubstantial. Right? The floating cloud itself originally does not exist. Life and death coming and going are also like this. But there is one thing which always remains clear and it is pure and clear, not depending on life and death. What then is the one pure and clear thing? Again, directly pointing, directly pointing to this aware nature, this knowing nature. It's pure and clear, not depending on life and death. So I just say that in the midst of our kind of tumultuous lives, there's an ongoing mix of two, you could say, fundamental qualities. And that would be stillness and movement. Just basic stillness and movement. This is the fabric of our lives. And within the teaching, these two are central to our experience of practice as well. When we're sitting, sometimes there's stillness in the background or in the midst of it all, and sometimes there's movement. We experience that very directly when we take the time to sit in meditation and pay attention to the mind. 
and our thoughts, the movement and the stillness. So with this final instruction goes like this. When deep certainty arises that stillness is unborn and movement unceasing. We know movement is unceasing. We've seen that. And that stillness and movement have an equal taste. You have begun to meditate correctly. I'll read through that one more. Certainty, this is confidence. So when deep certainty arises that stillness is unborn and movement is unceasing, and that stillness and movement have an equal taste, you have begun to meditate correctly. So, there we are. That was our talk on nature of mind. I'm sure <laughs> there might be questions here and there. I'd be happy to clarify anything that uh, I can possibly clarify for you. We're really close to the end of our time, but. Noam, you're really having an interesting smile there. <laughs> I'm just thinking uh, uh, the many, many, many questions I could ask and uh, how, how, yeah. It was beautiful, though. I, I appreciate it, and I'll think about it, and I, I don't have anything specific now. But Well, it's been, it's been recorded. You can listen to it again and see if it makes sense the second time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? You're equal to this. You're equal to this. Everything that I said tonight was actually a description of what we are and what we already have. This isn't far away. This isn't after, you know, a hundred day solo retreat or 12 years of retreat in the, in the caves for us. It's not, it's right here. That's what's so completely frustrating about it, you might say. Can I ask a quick question uh, Jeff, yeah. about equal? It's an interesting word choice, you know, just in that setting. Do you think that it is, is equal in a sense, equ equanimous, equanimity? Does it have that quality to it? Is that what that equal taste refers to? Because it's very, that's got me kind of, um, thinking about it, but I, but I feel like I can understand it as a, as a quality of equanimity. Like, well, there's a contrast between still and movement, but if you, if they have an equal taste, then they're sort of like. Have an equal taste. What is the, so what is the equal taste? What is the equal taste? In the grand scale, you could say the category of stillness and movement equal taste, but how about mayhem and love equal taste? How about um, confusion and confidence equal taste? The equality arises in our capacity to experience that clear mirror of awareness has no agenda and no preference. So whatever comes before it, you could say, again, it's a, an expression of that equal taste, equal taste. Taste is a direct experience, right? We get it on our tongue. Mm -hmm. Does that make a little more sense? Yeah, I, I've been, I've been uh, really noticing that sadness and joy have equal taste. Very, very good. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. That's, right. that's and in weird. order to have one, you kind of need to have the other. If you deny yourself either of those, there's a 
there's a quality that's not direct you know the, the directness comes from actually allowing both of those to occupy the same space great example really one i'm sure we can all relate to that that's beautiful I see Pam over in the corner there, Pamela. <laughs> Are you going to shut us down at some point? No, I'm going to just hang out until. Okay, you don't have any authority these days. Okay, <laughs> Laura, yes. So it's funny, as soon as you said uh, love and what was the the opposite emotion? You said love and, and um chaos or or yep. something have the and suddenly i i was more like jarred by that because love is um well we like to experience love and in so many ways love is kind of an a, a, a something that we try to cultivate we have a preference we have a preference and shouldn't we have a preference for you know what i mean like shouldn't we indeed have a preference to cultivate that. In fact, we do all these practices in Buddhism to cultivate loving kindness. Yes. Yeah. So do we really want to be in a state in which they are equal? What is pointed to here, yeah, and what you're saying is perfectly fine, that that is our intention, our aspiration is to actually practice for the benefit of all beings, save all beings, that feeling of actually, I'm not doing it for me, I'm doing it for everyone else, that wonderful feeling. But the underlying, this is like, we were going to the essence here, the deep down reality of how, almost like how the universe works and that all of the stars and the cosmos and the, our digestive juices and our tears and our perspiration, all of that is in the mix of this uh, equal taste. It's all manifest. It's all here in the moment. It's alive in terms of alive. It's like it's, it, we can experience it. That's 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 before choosing to experience love over choosing to experience jealousy. They're all experiences. They move us. We learn from them. So experience itself is always instructive and it's not in itself selective. Here's your next meal see what happens tomorrow and learn from it and appreciate that it's part of the mix you you share those experiences with everyone does that make a little more sense it's it's kind of a reach i gotta i gotta admit yeah it, I, it's it's a hard thing it's a hard thing to take in i mean i do understand there is a kind of overall neutrality to the universe you know yes 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 uh and yet as a human being within the universe i do make judgments about some things when it comes to my other sentient uh, other sentient beings are preferable in how i behave towards them something in you knows when you're on the right track something in you knows when you're aligned with how things are in their essence and that that calls us forward there is a feeling of i'm on the mark or this feels right that that it's not knowledge uh it's not a road map it's the reality of our experience in the moment. It's really, it's too simple. <laughs> yeah, it's too simple.
Karen, were you going to raise your hand or did you just scratch your cheek? <laughs> um, I wasn't going to raise my hand, but um, I will just say thank you for the talk. And I think I saw someone in the chat say it too, but I really liked your description of the um, awareness and uh, attention. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I don't hear too many teachers talk about it sometimes. And I know I've asked that question um, before and it was really nice to hear it explained in that way. And um, I really liked it. So. Good. And yeah. thanks to whoever mentioned it as well in the chat. I liked it. Yeah, I'm glad it landed. Well, I want each one of you who I can see are my love. It's wonderful being with you. This is a, a wonderful group and it's heartwarming to be with so many really sincere, curious, engaged people longing for something beyond what most people long for. It's really beautiful. And I, I feel very much in community with you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining me tonight. <laughs>